following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. In this course, we are learning how to experience the steps of yoga as explained by Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras. Patanjali taught Ashtanga Yoga, which means eight-limbed union, and it is the same practical approach that you'll find in any spiritual tradition. The eight steps described by Patanjali are presented according to the point of view or idiosyncrasy of yoga, but the practical steps are the same universally as is the experience they are based on. In other words, this is similar to viewing the sunrise. We may use different words to describe it because of our language and culture, but the experience can be had by anyone. They just need to be in the right place at the right time. Similarly, by knowing how to position the consciousness, we can also experience what Patanjali experienced and taught about because that experience is accessible to the consciousness of any living being. In this course, we are studying the eight steps of yoga because they're easy to understand and easy to practice. This is the main thing in this course. We're emphasizing facts. Samael Anvior wrote in his books, the hour has arrived to abandon theories and go directly to what is practical. In this course, we are focusing on making our spiritual life practical. Up to now in this course, we've talked about the first three of the eight limbs, yama, niyama, and asana how they relate to each other, and how we make them practical in our day-to-day -day life. They are lived through our ethics and through being relaxed. To have genuine ethics, we have to be aware of ourselves. Now, awareness is not explicitly presented in yoga as one of the eight limbs. It is not intellectually written as one of the eight limbs. Instead, it is implied. This is because its original audience did not need to be told about awareness. To them, it was obvious and well-known that awakening consciousness starts with being present in the moment, here and now, all the time. Nowadays, that is not obvious to people. So we have to explicitly state it because people ignore the fundamental basis of awakening consciousness, which is to be present, to be here and now. It is implicit in every step of the eight limbs that one needs to be developing cognizance, which is that awareness, but with understanding. It is awareness that knows. It is awareness presence with intelligence. That is what we mean by cognizance. So these parameters that I've outlined for you, facts, awareness, cognizance, are all implicit in yoga. In the first four lectures of this course, we went into detail into all of that. So I'm reminding you and refreshing you about it because you have to remember those things in order to understand today's lecture. In fact, to really understand today's lecture, you should already be practicing many things that have been explained in the previous lectures. If you're not practicing them, this lecture today will not be of use to you. Again, it's because this course is based on practice. If you are not practicing, this lecture can't help you. But if you're actually doing the practices, then now you can start to deal with the obstacles that you've been facing. So if you've not been practicing, go back, start from the beginning, 
study the lectures, but most of all, put them into practice every day. Yoga means union. It means to unite ourselves with something true, something real. The Dalai Lama said that the word yoga means, in general, to join one's mind with an actual fact. So real yoga is the same as the Latin word religare, which is the root of the word religion, which means to reunite what was separated. That term is useful in the Western religions because Western religions are based on the simple understanding that in ancient times, we as a consciousness, the purity that we have within, was separated from the purity of the being, of divinity. There was a division that occurred psychologically within us. In Western religions, that division is symbolized by the expulsion from Eden, when Adam and Eve left Eden. The word Eden literally means bliss. So that separation was when Adam and Eve, or you and me, left bliss. That division occurred because of impurity. Purity and impurity are like oil and water. They cannot mix with each other. They can be scattered in the same place, but when you look closely at the different parts of a given entity that has purity and impurity in it, those elements are not really joined. And this is true in our psychology as well. The impure elements are desires, lust, anger, pride, envy, fear, etc. The pure element is the part of consciousness that is not yet trapped in desire. So in us, these are all jumbled together. We have a mess in us psychologically, and we have not been educated to differentiate between the purity and impurity, nor how to remove the impurity so we can return to a state of happiness or bliss, what in the Bible is called Eden. Real yoga teaches us how to differentiate between purity and impurity, and the beginning of that is awareness. First, we have to become aware. So in us, the pure and impure elements are in conflict, chaos. But although they might be mixed up, like when you make a salad dressing and you mix up the oil and the vinegar, they don't really blend. If you leave the dressing to sit still, it will separate again. If you leave a glass of dirty water to sit still, the heavier parts will sink and the lighter parts will rise. This is basic science, and it applies to our psychology also. All of us are filled with impurities. But if we stop stirring the mind and the heart and the body, if we let them rest, the confusion of elements will separate. And then we can not only have peace, but we can more easily tell the difference between what is pure and what is not. This is why we need to learn to meditate. But the beginning of it is learning to be aware. Our confused, chaotic, impure inner state is why we don't have union with what is pure, which is our inner being, what we can call God or the Buddha or the Father. There are many names for that spirit. In yoga, we talk about this as Ishvara, which we described in the previous lecture. Ishvara has many implications as a term. It means our creative power, but that divine creative power related to purity, divinity, the individual that we think we are has been separated from that purity because of our own actions and because of the impurities that we have in us. That separation, symbolized as the expulsion from Eden, does not occur because of God, because of the divine, or because of some kind of cosmic joke. It happens because of desire. Hinduism and Buddhism recognize that the cause of suffering is desire. In Western traditions, this is symbolized in various ways, but over time has been obscured. Of course, this notion is completely rejected by modern society, who adores and worships desires of all kinds. So when we hear about this, we're generally horrified. The desire that causes suffering has many faces. It includes the gross, obvious desires, but also many very subtle psychological elements all of which act like filters on our perception, causing us to perceive inaccurately and thereafter respond inaccurately. Real yoga is about recovering true perception. True perception is the natural state of the consciousness. And to experience it, we simply need to remove that which conditions the consciousness. The conditioning is psychological impurity. 
This image from the Mahabharata represents how the pure consciousness perceives the divine. In the story, this woman is a virgin, which represents the virginal, pure, clean, undefiled consciousness. She represents what is called in Buddhism our Buddha nature, Tathagata Garbha, or the seed, the essence that all of us have inside, but is trapped in defilement. It is asleep. It is undeveloped. It has the potential to become an angel, a Buddha, but it is not yet awakened. So in this image, this virgin, because of her purity, receives from the divine a pure child. And that represents how the divine can grow that seed into a perfect human being. To have yoga, union with divinity, we have to remove that seed from its conditioning and nourish it so it will grow. In Hinduism, in yoga, this is called self-realization or liberation. Moksha. And this is what most people want when they come to religion. Liberation means, of course, to be liberated or freed from suffering. Self-realization means to know the reality of oneself. To achieve this, we have to dissolve all impurity that we have within ourselves to completely clean everything and have no impurities at all inside of us, psychologically on every level. That's not an easy task, but it's been done before and can be done by any of us. We all have that potential. Any one of us can become a Buddha, an angel, a master. In the ultimate sense, that's what's meant by the word yoga. One is totally clean of impurity, which we can also call karma. And then the union happens spontaneously, naturally, because that union, yoga, is the natural state of the consciousness in which it is unified with its root nature. It is itself. And be able to perceive that and experience that without any conditioning, without any obscuration, without any suffering. And that is why that state is called nirvana. That word literally means cessation. That word is used because it refers to the cessation or the ending of all the cycling and repeating elements in us. Those elements are called samsara, which means circling. Desires repeat. Desires want more and more and more. No desire is ever satisfied. They are always wanting more. We are foolish enough to think that if we keep feeding a desire, eventually we'll satisfy it, but we never do. That insatiable appetite is a sign of samsara, circling the tendency of the ego to repeat. When those impurities are removed from within us, what remains is the purity, the freed consciousness, united with its root, its true nature, which is the being itself, Ishvara. It's a long process to reach that. That liberation or self-realization is what we mean by yoga in the full and complete sense. But we can also use the term yoga in a smaller or relative sense to describe uh, an experience of liberation, something that is maybe more short term. So union or yoga can describe having a brief experience of the consciousness liberated from conditioning and to actually know from one's own experience what that liberation really is. Now, let me explain something important about this point. I'm not talking about someone's ideas about liberation or anyone's theories or beliefs or scriptures about it. I'm talking about the experience that the consciousness had when it is freed, even briefly, from its cage, its condition, from desire. Even a brief instant of liberation is an intense, beautiful, momentous experience and important. Anyone who practices real yoga can experience that. That's really the point. And yet, we have to understand that a momentary experience of liberation is not the same as a full liberation, full realization, the actualization of liberation. So to understand this, we can equate this to a prisoner in a cell, which really is like us. The cage or prison is our sense of self, our psychological condition. We're so accustomed to it, we think it's normal, but it isn't. It's a cage. Only someone who's experienced what is outside of the cage will know there is something more than the cage. But the prisoner who's been in that cage for so long 
will think that's just normal. So people who have had experiences outside the cage therefore know that there's such a thing as liberation. They've tasted it. So we can equate this to someone who has learned to meditate and has had the experience of samadhi, of being free of the cage of the ego and being liberated even for an instant. And in that experience, one then knows what it is to be free of the cage and what liberation is, what yoga is. Someone who's never experienced that may have lots of beautiful ideas and theories, but they have no idea what yoga religion really is about. So the point is one has to be completely free of the cage before one is truly liberated, meaning you can leave the cage and never return to it. That only happens when all of your karma is paid, when all of your ego is dead. And a being like that is someone like Jesus, Krishna, Buddha, Moses, very well-developed human beings. This distinction is important and is lost uh, on many students of yoga. Many think as soon as they reach some experience of being liberated, they think they reached full liberation. So they think as soon as they experience what they might call a nirvana or samadhi, then they start calling themselves a master or a yogi and they go around teaching people that they are Swami so-and-so and I will teach you the way to liberation. And they're mistaken. Because they have the ego very alive. A lot of pride, a lot of lust, a lot of anger, a lot of envy. Sure, they may be able to reach those states from time to time and experience that. And they may help others to do that, but that's not the same thing as being liberated from the ego, liberated from karma. How can we recognize the state of true liberation? We study those who reached it. Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, Moses. We also study ourselves. If we have pride, we are not liberated. If we have lust, we are not liberated, and so on. So these distinctions are important and are all illustrated here in the Tree of Life, which symbolizes all the levels of the being the levels of ourselves. In simple terms, the superior levels we can call heavens or nirvanas, directly in the middle, we see the physical plane, which in Hebrew is called Malkut, which means the kingdom. And below that, we see the inferior worlds, the hell realms, which is our own mind. Union yoga is when the conditioned soul the one that is conditioned by those hell realms, the impure elements, is liberated from those worlds. And all of that tree of life is one thing. It is its true nature. It is absolutely free of conditioning. And the consciousness experiences that. That liberation, that yoga, as I mentioned, can be brief or it can become permanent. So obviously our goal is to make that become permanent. And today we're going to discuss the obstacles that stand in our way. The Yoga Sutras say, These are the obstacles to achieving yoga. Disease, dullness, doubt, carelessness, laziness, intemperance, worldliness or sensuality, mistaken notions due to illusions, missing the point, instability, causing distractions of the mind. The first obstacle that's mentioned here is this word in English, disease. In English, we think disease means leprosy, AIDS, Ebola, those types of physical ailments. But here in this scripture, disease has a much deeper meaning. In Sanskrit, it is vyadi, which, mean, which really can mean many things. It can simply mean disorder. It can also mean sickness or plague or really any tormenting thing, any kind of disequilibrium, not just physical, but also emotional and mental. Any disequilibrium or imbalance that we experience is an obstacle to us achieving yoga. Yoga is a psychological state, a state of consciousness. Anything that disturbs our psyche, our consciousness, is disease. So let's analyze that. Firstly, in this tradition, we talk about facts. If we're trying to achieve yoga, meaning we're trying to adopt a spiritual path and experience it, then where do we start with facts? What can we confirm? 
what can we establish is factual? Well, obviously, we can start right here, right now, with who we are here and now. Not the theories that we have, not the beliefs that we have, as cherished as they may be, not what we believe in, not what we disbelieve, not what we want to be or may be afraid of being, but facts only. Who are we here and now in facts? First, we're in a physical body. We can confirm this through our perception. In our physical body, we can experience the physical world. So we can call the activities of the physical body a type of intelligence that functions without much intervention on our part. The body digests, it breathes, it moves, it acts. It has many functions that do not require my constant oversight. So we call that, that intelligence the motor instinctive sexual brain. There's a whole range of activities related to the spinal column. We can also confirm through our perception that we experience emotions that are constantly in flux in reaction to our perceptions. We also experience thoughts. So there are two more brains, an emotional one and an intellectual one. Often, these two are in conflict with each other and are also in conflict with the body. This is why we're tense all the time. This is why we're sick all the time. This is why we're in doubt, in despair, in confusion, uncertainty, angry, unhappy. Because these three parts of ourselves are out of balance with each other. They're out of control. We scarcely know about them. And we certainly do not manage them with cognizance. Remember I explained that word, cognizance, attention with understanding. When one has cognizance in the present moment of the three brains, one manages them intelligently and with awareness. When one does that, one is relaxed, one is at peace, there is no conflict. So we can say that state of being is a type of yoga, union, where the three brains are unified by a controlling power, which is the consciousness. That is a type or a state of yoga. In this tradition, we call it psychological equilibrium. It is the absolute prerequisite to get any further in the teachings. For example, if you want to reach samadhi, ecstasy, that feeling that we were describing of liberation, where the consciousness is free of the ego, first, you have to have psychological equilibrium. There's no way around that. How do you know if you have psychological equilibrium? First, equilibrium is a state of serenity in which the three brains do their jobs harmoniously and the consciousness remains aware of them. One remains in conscious control of the three brains. That is, one is not controlled by the impulses or states of the intellect, emotion, or the motor instinctual sexual brain. Instead, the consciousness controls them. Having psychological equilibrium means you can transform impressions consciously. That is, whatever you are perceiving and experiencing, you do not lose awareness of yourself, nor do you become identified with anything you perceive. You, as the consciousness, retain control over your three brains. If you are forgetting yourself, you are not in equilibrium. If your three brains are wild without conscious control, you are not in equilibrium. Having psychological equilibrium means at any given moment, anywhere, anytime, you can sit still, close your eyes, and enter samadhi. That means with your consciousness, perceive the reality. That means you can meditate on a given thing, enter into that thing, and get information about that thing. That may sound like a magical power, but it is not. It is the natural ability of liberated consciousness. Consciousness that is not bound or conditioned by desire. It has that ability naturally, spontaneously, on its own, by itself. It does not require any effort. It just happens. We have lost that because we have no psychological equilibrium. Our consciousness is asleep and it is submerged in chaotic desires, memories, worries, etc. So when we close our eyes and try to meditate, we see a chaotic, stormy sea of thoughts, emotions, and sensations in the body. Anyone who tries to learn meditation faces that reality. The brain, the heart, and the body will not rest. The thoughts keep coming, emotions keep coming, 
memories, wishes, desires, wants, fears, pain, discomfort, sleepiness, excitement. All these states that seem to be random and constantly changing. And then we fall asleep. And then we wake up half an hour later and realize I was supposed to be meditating. Right there's the proof that we have not reached psychological equilibrium. It is a simple fact. To go any further in yoga, you need psychological equilibrium. This is the first obstacle, dis-ease in the three brains, imbalance. The antidotes to disease are simple. Study your three brains. Become aware of your three brains and how they function. Don't theorize about them. Instead, look at the facts. Study yourself as though you were a doctor studying a patient or a scientist studying a strange life form. Study all the activities of your three brains and the results of how you use them. If you find a negative state in yourself, observe the facts of what happened before that state arose. How were the three brains being used? Look at your physicality. Study the health of your body. Work on it and improve it. This body is the first floor of your temple. If your temple were filled with chemicals, junk food, cigarette smoke, alcohol, and drugs, why would God come there? If your temple is filled with prostitutes, why would God come there? Your temple has three floors, the physical body, the heart, and the mind. If you want to experience divinity, prepare your temple, clean it, make it sacred, make it pure. Just like Jesus drove the money lenders out of the temple. That's a symbol for us to drive out from our temple, the worldly ones, our desires. Those desires are the obstacles to yoga. God is not the obstacle. Our inner being is not the obstacle. Our desires are the obstacle. So the first step is to study the facts of our three brains. Start with the body. Establish good health. The first way to do this is to radically improve your diet. In synthesis, don't eat junk. Eat real food. Find out what foods give you genuine and observable nourishment. And find out which ones don't and stop eating them. Pay attention to how your diet affects your mind, your heart, and your body. If you truly eat well, you will not get sick. You will have lots of energy. You will be relaxed and capable of enormous activity. We have a whole course about this called Healthy Spirituality. Study it. Put it into practice. What you eat affects everything about your life. If you want a good life, eat the cleanest and purest food you can get. If you have good physical health, your other two brains will be much more balanced and capable. Good physical health is the foundation of emotional, intellectual, and spiritual health. If your physical health is poor, everything else in you suffers. Really observe and be cognizant of eating. Do not just eat and watch TV or eat and talk with your friends or eat and talk on the phone all without tasting every bite. With each bite that you take, be cognizant of it. In that, you are applying all the power of your consciousness to transforming that material into an energy that will saturate all the atoms of your body with a much higher value than food that is eaten like an animal. An animal eats mindlessly, instinctively, automatically. If you eat mindlessly, then you will get a mindless result, a mechanical result. But if you eat with cognizance, with awareness, your food will have a new vibration, especially if it is very good food, clean food, with no chemicals or artificial substances, not something that came out of a factory, a can, or a box, but something that came from Mother Nature. Drink good, healthy liquids made by nature, especially clean water. Abandon factory-made drinks, sodas, sugars, alcohols, and all the poisons that society is trying to stuff down our throats. Don't drink those artificial substances. They are junk. They were made to get your money, not to give you health. They do not feed the soul. In fact, those artificial drinks rob your glands and organs of all their powers. If you don't realize that, study it, and you'll find out. Apply the same principle to breathing. Do not breathe in chemicals or toxic smoke, such as cigarette smoke, etc. What you breathe goes directly into your bloodstream and into your heart. All these factors may seem small, but they add together and make something big. The next part of the physical body is sexual energy. 
If we're experiencing a loss of the sexual energy, then we are depleting the body of its most potent source of energy. There is no source of energy that we have access to, practically speaking, factually speaking, that is more powerful than the sexual force. This is why all the ancient traditions emphasized the need to restrain that energy and transform it for spiritual purposes, and not to utilize it for desire or lust, not to utilize it for pleasure or entertainment, but to devote it to spiritual practice. That is why beginners are taught practices like pranayama, breathing practices, and transmutation practices like bodily positions where you learn to transform that energy and harness it. It is a type of chastity. It is a type of purity that trains the body to recover its normal, natural state of holding that energy rather than wasting it in orgasms, and to instead transmute it, liberating it from animal lust. If we are constantly losing our sexual energy, whether willfully or not, we will never experience the states of consciousness that we're longing to reach. If we're trying to reach samadhi, liberation, we never will. Without stored and purified sexual energy, it's impossible. We also can never reach liberation. It's impossible. The sexual energy is the power that liberates the consciousness. It is the power that becomes harnessed by the being, by the Divine Mother, and becomes what is called Kundalini. Kundalini is the sexual force, but awakened. When the sexual force is transformed and illuminated, it becomes Kundalini, the Divine Mother herself. Her power, her energy, her force, her intelligence, which liberates us. In Hinduism, this is represented by Durga, a beautiful goddess. Durga has many arms and many weapons, symbolically, and she uses that to conquer the demon ego. She is that flaming fire called Kundalini, which is the sexual force. Without that force within us, she can't do anything to help us. So we must stop the loss of sexual energy, whether through masturbation, the sexual act, wet dreams, through any type of willful or unwillful loss. It has to be restrained and transformed. When that energy is restrained and transformed, rather than creating an external physical sensation or creating an external physical body, it begins to create on a higher level within us. Contemplate that. This is very logical. Everyone wants the beautiful ecstasy of samadhi. What energy can create that? If you think about it, if the sexual energy produces that minor brief pleasure of the orgasm, then it makes sense to realize that the same energy is what produces the ecstasy of the consciousness. When that energy is redirected within, up the spine, throughout all the energetic centers in the body, into the brain. Of course it's going to produce something. Something magical. Something wonderful. And that's why all the old traditions emphasize that all the beginners start with restraining the sexual energy. And then when they can control it, they are introduced towards sexual cooperation between man and woman so they can fully harness that force. This is symbolized in every religion. Here, we're explicit about it. We teach it directly. If we restrain and harness the sexual force, psychological equilibrium can be reached quickly. Additional factors to watch out for as signs of physical imbalance include constipation, incontinence, sicknesses. These are all physical signs of disequilibrium and we need to find their causes and repair them. But remember, dis-ease is not merely physical. If we discover that emotionally we are always swinging on a pendulum in which one day we are depressed and we hate life, and the next day we are so ecstatic and happy, and the day after that we want to kill ourselves again, that pendulum swing is a sign of a terrible imbalance in the emotional center. Perhaps we're addicted to expending emotional energy through gossip, TV, sports, music. Maybe we're addicted to expending intellectual energy through reading too much, theorizing too much, debating too much, analyzing too much. Perhaps we're addicted to expending physical energy through hyperactivity, excessive work, excessive exercise, obsessive behaviors, etc. So we need to study our three brains for imbalances. From moment to moment, from day to day, we're not in control of using the three brains, but instead they run on automatic, switching from one center to the next without any sense of direction at all. When we should think carefully about something, we instead react instinctively or emotionally. When we should respond emotionally to a situation, we instead respond with the intellect. In short, 
we don't know how to use the three brains. So we waste energy and we make messes of so many situations. And the sum total is at the end of the day, we're exhausted from wasting our energy and as confused and uncertain as the day before and often worse. We are constantly impacted by all of our problems, pains, sufferings, and desires, and unable to get control of ourselves. This is how people are, but it isn't normal. It's a type of suffering. It is dis-ease in balance. Someone who has balance in three brains is calm, relaxed, and is able to handle challenges with equanimity without being shocked, without overreacting. They might experience pain and happiness. They may experience displeasure. They may experience frustration, but it doesn't knock them down. They can take it and still smile and still be in control of their temple. They don't waste energy. One way to really work on this and establish equilibrium is to work consciously with the three brains every day. Really start to become aware of them. A great way to do that is to make sure that every day you use each one consciously and in a positive way. We recommend every day to use your intellect and study scripture. Use your intellect to analyze good things, positive things that will help you and help others. And use your emotional brain in the same way. Listen to positive, uplifting music, like classical music. Make art. Work in a garden. Cook food. Help someone who needs help. Go to your neighbor's house and help them if they need something. Take care of someone who's sick. Use your emotional energy in a way that helps you and others. Care for people. Be kind. And exercise your body. Eat well. Drop bad habits and adopt good ones. Many people work at jobs where they are sitting in front of a computer all day and then go home at night to a computer or TV for the rest of the night. That's absurd. That's why we're killing ourselves. If you have that type of lifestyle, change it. Give up the TV. Give up the internet at home or whatever you do on the computer, browsing around looking at nothing. Use that time to use your other brains. If you're on a computer all day with your job, then when you get home, don't touch the computer or TV. Be active. Go for a walk. Play an instrument. Engage your three brains every day, and in this way, you start to learn how to balance them, how they work, how they affect you, and how to use them for your benefit and others. This is very practical, and if you do it, it will change your life. None of these steps are hard to do, but they have measurable effects. Change them all, and you will find big changes in your experience of life. The next obstacle that's mentioned by Patanjali is stianya, which is dullness. It can also mean density, apathy, sloth, heaviness, idleness. And generally, this is interpreted as a lack of enthusiasm to do spiritual practice, a lack of energy. It is a psychological heaviness or laziness. Dullness in this sense means to have a type of psychology that the teachings are not penetrating. And really, this is the case for most of us and most of modern society. Sure, we might like the teachings, but are we practicing them in a way that is creating powerful changes in our ways of thinking, feeling, and acting? Are we so identified with sports, dramas, TV, bank account, that we're not really putting the teachings into practice? Life goes by very quickly and is over before we realize it. You can't get back yesterday. It's gone. Each particle of energy that you expend is gone. Each instant that you expend is gone. Each instant, we are marching closer and closer to death. But we don't comprehend that, and the evidence is how much time and energy we waste. We think spending our time browsing Facebook is useful, or looking through gossip magazines, or shopping at the mall for junk we don't need. We're asleep. This is dullness. This is a lack of comprehension, a lack of cognizance, a lack of understanding. We don't see reality. Instead, we drift along in a dream state, dreaming all night and dreaming all day, fascinated with the projections of our mind, with our worries and fears, with our traumas and fantasies. We waste so much time and so much energy on so many stupid things. And this is dullness. Our dullness must change if we really want to reach yoga, if we really want to experience the facts of the consciousness, the facts of the being. We can do it, but we have to break through our own dullness, whatever it is that lulls us into a false sense of security. Become aware of the times that you go on autopilot, 
or those times when you forget to observe yourself, to remember yourself, to be present in the moment, gathering information about your psychology. Whenever you are not present, observing, watchful, it is because of dullness. So find the qualities in yourself that allow that dullness to emerge and change them. The antidote to dullness is to drop bad habits and adopt good ones. Use practices that can energize you, such as pranayama, runic practices, rites of rejuvenation. And these are practices that activate and utilize energy to stimulate the consciousness. When you learn pranayama, you learn to retain your sexual energy. And then the pranayama, which means to harness the wind, takes the forces of that energy and saturates the nervous system. It loads it up with energy so that the consciousness will be stimulated. The purpose of that is to stimulate the consciousness to be awake, to perceive and cut through illusions. The rites of rejuvenation and the runic practices do the same thing. So we learn to charge ourselves with solar energy, not physical solar energy, but Christic solar energy to feed and nourish the consciousness. These types of exercises are powerful, but only if we use them. If they just remain a theory for us or something that we've read about, they have no value. They have to be used every day. Every student without exception lacks willpower to awaken. All of us are in a conditioned state, a state in which the mind tells us many things in order to sustain its existence. So we may feel defeated or weak or hopeless, full of despair, or fascinated with different types of experiences in life. We lack confirmation of the truth. Religion is just a bunch of theories to us, but we really don't know because we don't have experience. And this is all a state of dullness. Anyone can break it, but to do so, it requires effort. And that effort is not with the intellect, it's with the consciousness. The effort is not with belief or theories, it's with consciousness. The consciousness has to become present in the moment. It has to awaken and start seeing the truth. And to do that, it needs energy. You energize the consciousness when you save your sexual energy, when you save physical energy and emotional and intellectual energy and let the consciousness use it. This breaks dullness. Another great way to work in dullness is to serve others without seeking a reward for yourself. In Hindu traditions, this is called seva or karma yoga. Volunteer, donate, give of your time and energy to help people who need it. Helping others energizes your consciousness too. The next obstacle is doubt. In Sanskrit, samzaya literally means risk, doubt, danger, hesitation, or sleep. In yoga, doubt refers to that tendency of the ego to look for contradictions, especially because the ego itself feels threatened. Awakening consciousness and following the spiritual path spells the end for the ego, and it fights against that. So specifically, the most important doubt is how the ego seeks any means it can to take us away from the spiritual practice. The ego doubts the scriptures, the teachers, the masters, the practices, the methods, the tradition, everything. It seeks out anything it can in order to disempower the consciousness. And doubt is one of its most powerful tools. And sadly, because our consciousness is asleep, we go along with the doubt because we have no experience to show what the facts are. No matter how ridiculous or superficial our doubts may be, we generally lack the ability to see them for what they are. And this is how even the most devoted students of spirituality eventually drift away. Doubt infects them because they never really practiced. Doubt only has power when we don't have experience. Doubt has power in those who don't practice. When we're dedicated to spiritual practice, we gain experience. We see the results of the practice, and then we have facts to rely on. Thus, doubt is rendered powerless. When you experience a fact, doubt cannot challenge it. But if you have not experienced something, doubt is very powerful. And that's why even the best believers, the most fervent believers, can become the greatest cynics and vice versa. The most cynical, negative, and anti-religious person can suddenly become the most devout religious person. This flip-flop between belief and disbelief is a pendulum of disequilibrium and is caused by doubt, which is simply a lack of experience of the facts. 
Doubt is a mental construction. So it has two contrary sides, yes and no, acceptance and rejection. This duality is a hypnotic force that clouds our perceptions. Doubt is subtle. We often don't realize that we have it. Our ego is very tricky with doubt. It says, I've studied that teaching and it's really interesting and I like the concepts, but the people at that school are so annoying. That tradition must be fake. That is doubt. It's using an excuse, a justification to keep the soul away from the real path. We do that all the time. We don't realize how our mind is creating our perception. We just accept our interpretations of things as true. The ego will find any excuse it can to keep us from the path. For instance, many people read the books of Samael and Vior and reject them because of how he wrote. They don't like his tone, or they don't like the way he structured his sentences, or they don't like the book covers. It's really amazing that people are given the most sacred science that exists, but reject it because they don't like the packaging it came in. That is due to doubt, and that is the ego, and it's really sad. Doubt exists because we have ideas about the spiritual path, but our ideas are wrong and we're unwilling to see it. Generally, we only want to believe whatever is convenient to our desires. Anything that contradicts our desires is rejected. So many people reject Gnosis because they're unwilling to recognize that identification with pleasure is the cause of the suffering. That's one form of doubt. Their lust is behind that doubt. The ego does not understand that someone who is awakening consciousness actually experiences superior types of pleasure that are related to the consciousness. The antidote to doubt is acquired through experiencing the facts. The only way to expel doubt is to experience the facts of our spiritual practice. Our ego wants us to believe that we can become spiritually developed while still enjoying all the pleasures of the senses. And there are many people who genuinely believe that. The facts demonstrate otherwise, but no one is willing to look at the facts. Our doubt, fed by the ego, refuses to see the reality. Instead, we project our desires onto our perceptions. We want to see a certain way. We want to fulfill our desires. And so we do our best to avoid anything that contradicts our desires. We don't want to see the truth, so our mind lies. A friend of mine told me a story that illustrates this point. My friend worked at a retail store where there were a lot of employees to handle all the customers, and some of the customers were regulars. This store is near a famous fashion school, so many of the customers were models and fashion designers from all over the world. One such customer was an exceptionally beautiful, petite young woman from India who was quite famous for her beauty. And of course, everyone noticed her. And there's one employee who was dumbstruck by her. He was a big tall, confident, handsome man. But whenever this beautiful petite woman would come in, he would be overcome with nervousness and refuse to go near her, but would watch entranced from a distance. And after, he le after she left, he would go to the other employees and say, that woman is so pretty. She makes me so nervous. I can't talk to her. I wish I had the courage to talk to her. And my friend tried to tell him that this girl was no one special, but he refused to believe it. He was too impressed by her appearance. So the employees were all really entertained by this because this guy who seemed so confident the rest of the time would become like a scared child whenever that woman came in. So finally it happened that she came in and he was the only one available to help her. And he had no choice but to approach her. He was terrified. And of course, all the other employees were watching, entertained by this. Uh, so he reluctantly went to help her and he said, how may I help you? And when she answered, every other word that came out of her mouth was filthy, foul, gutter talk. The crudest sort of language you can think of. And as soon as, he start, as soon as she started talking, he realized that she was crude, dirty, repulsive. And all of his nervousness went away. All of his admiration of her vanished. The illusion was dispelled when he saw the facts of who she really was. So all of us suffer this same illusion all the time in many ways. We want to believe that what appears to be beautiful really is beautiful. But especially these days, the packaging is always made to be so beautiful, but inside is garbage given to us just to make money, just to get our attention, just to get power over us. And this is true of people, of food, products, religions, 
modern culture capitalizes on this tendency of our ego to be seduced by appearances. And we ourselves live by this tendency. We struggle to make ourselves appear beautiful while ignoring the filthiness that's inside of us. So whatever we perceive, we interpret according to our desires. The man in the story saw a beautiful woman, but he didn't see her for what she truly was. Everyone else did, but he refused to see it. In fact, avoided seeing it until he was forced to. Similarly, we don't see what's real. We're seeing what the mind wants us to see. We see our desires, our fears, our worries, our anxieties, our cravings, our aversions. We don't see the facts. So doubt and belief are two extremes of the same problem. Neither are based on facts, but are instead interpretations that seek to affirm a precondition. So as an example, religious fanatics see everything in accordance with their fanaticism. They interpret everything to fit their view. They don't see reality. They twist the facts to fit their beliefs. In the same way, the science fanatics do the same thing. They twist the facts to fit their limited view. They want their, they, everything they perceive to fit the model, the precondition, the concept that they already have. Science claims that they want to know the truth, but really they want reality to fit into their concept. So both sides twist the facts to fit their limited view. So these are two extremes of the same tendency, doubt. They say it's faith, they say it's belief, they say it's science, but really it's doubt. One says there's God while the other says there's no God. But the thing is, the truth is, neither one of them has any experience of the fact of God. They only have beliefs and doubts. One believes religion and doubts science. The other believes science and doubts religion. Both are mistaken. Both are deluded by their own minds. The one who experiences does not doubt or believe. The one who experiences the reality knows. And when one knows, one does not need doubt or belief. All of us have doubts and beliefs about religion, spirituality, heaven, etc. But it's all fantasies because it's not based in experience. We have fantasies about heaven, about liberation. We have fantasies about samadhi. We have fantasies about astral projection. We have fantasies about the, what the masters are, about what angels are, about what God is. We have fantasies about the past and the future. None of it's real. And the sum of it all is all these fantasies make us suffer from this conditioned doubt. Doubt is not just to say, no, it's not like that. Doubt also says it is like this instead. Doubt is a belief that is mistaken. It's a mistaken idea, a mistaken concept. And that's what's meant by doubt. It is to not see truth. And that is why Samael and Vior wrote, the path of wisdom does not rely on believing, not believing, or doubting. The path of wisdom consists of acquiring, analyzing, meditating, and experiencing. When we experience the reality of meditation, when we have a real experience of samadhi and the consciousness is liberated from the ego, even for a brief moment, there will be no more doubt for you. That experience becomes part of your soul. You will never forget it. The mind will still have doubt, but the soul has experienced. And it gives you incredible power to overcome the doubt of the mind. It gives you certainty. It gives you knowledge because you experience what's real. The antidotes to doubt are many. The main one is acquire experience through practice. Practice, practice, practice a lot. For every page of scripture that you read, you should be meditating for much more time than it took you to read the page. Most of us will read hundreds of pages and listen to hours of lectures and then meditate for 10 minutes. That's unbalanced. It should be the other way around. 10 minutes of reading and hours of practice. This is how you should really work. If you really want effective change, work like that. Study the root scriptures. Don't read new age popular spirituality. Study the proven masters, proven teachers, proven traditions. You can rely on Jesus, Buddha, and Krishna. They're not trying to make money from you. 
You can't rely on writers who want to make money. They're only going to tell you what will earn them an income. Revive your sense of wonder and astonishment by getting back in touch with nature and all of its creatures. Many of us are never in nature. We're surrounded by concrete, plastic, and steel. And that has a very powerful influence on our psychology. It is really important to go out and really look at the universe around you. Really look at it like a child looks at it, the way a child looks at a butterfly, a flower, or a star. Recover that sense of astonishment, that sense of wonder. Recover the mind that does not know, but is inquiring to know. There is no doubt in that mind. There is only openness to the new. We all have experienced it. Remember when you were a child, when you were able to perceive and look at things as if they were completely new, because they were. Remember how different life tasted then? It wasn't cynical, dark, or sarcastic. We weren't always trying to hurt each other or criticize each other or seek things we didn't have. We were incredibly impressed by a raindrop, a snowflake, by the shape of the clouds. And all of us have that capacity inside. It's part of the consciousness. It's part of the soul. Revive it. Work with it as much as you can. That quality dispels doubt very powerfully. And you have the power to engage it. It's a matter of your perception, how you're choosing to perceive your world. The next important obstacle in Sanskrit is avarati. And this can mean intemperance, incontinence, worldliness, sensuality. We think this refers only to sex, and it does relate to that, but really it's about attraction to sensations. Sensuality. All of us are addicted to the senses and the vibrations of energy in the senses. All of us. We don't understand the senses at all. We're addicted to the sensations of sex, the sensations of certain foods, certain music, fashions, crowds, words. We love the sensation of being praised. Some of us love the sensation of being blamed or criticized. Some of us love the sensations of fighting or being in conflict with others. Some of us love the sensation of feeling defeated or feeling successful. These are all just sensations, physical, emotional, and intellectual sensations. This is sensuality. We are captivated by the illusion of the senses. And we need to cut through that illusion and see the truth. That sensations are impermanent, unreliable, and deceptive. Samuel wrote, that pleasure never endures long enough, and this is why the thirst for pleasure is the ailment that makes the intellectual animals most pitiable. Even so-called spiritual people are constantly searching for pleasure, but they call it spiritual pleasures, like the pleasure being at church, at temple, with the group, with spiritual friends, the pleasure of the sexual act, or doing rituals, or the pleasure we feel of looking like we know spirituality and teaching others feeling like a spiritual authority. These are all just sensations. Sensations are illusions and attachments to them are obstacles to real yoga. We need to cut through illusions and attachments. And the way we do it is to analyze the facts, study impermanence. Sensations are temporary. Become cognizant of that and you will lessen the power that sensations have on your consciousness. Study the pendulums of nature. When you indulge in pleasure, pain will be the outcome. This is a law of nature. Observe those who become addicted to their pleasure. Their addiction destroys them painfully. Liberate yourself from addiction to pleasure and you liberate yourself from much pain. You instead come to know peace. Study karma, cause and effect. Every action has a cost and a consequence. Chasing pleasure has costs and consequences. The mind doesn't want to see that, but it is a law of nature. Become free of the chain of the senses. Learn to see sensations for what they are, impermanent, temporary flares of energy. In this way, one observes how pleasure arrives, lasts a moment, then passes away. So does pain. What we need to do is be centered in that which is always remaining, the consciousness, the perception. And with this point of view, one is not disturbed by pleasure or pain. One does not seek them out or strive to avoid them, but instead observes them for what they are and thus becomes free of their conditioning. And this attitude liberates energy and consciousness. It frees us from much suffering. 
We need the capability to be indifferent to sensations and be serene in any situation. And when we have serenity, then conditions are no longer conditioning. They come and go like clouds. We don't suffer because of them. Instead, we remain cognizant and able to act appropriately without being a victim of illusions. Being indifferent to sensations means we can respond without being conditioned, without being mechanical, without being instinctive. This is why the great masters behave the way they do. They are able to act appropriately, incredibly, because sensations do not cloud their vision. The next few uh, obstacles mentioned in the scripture include mistaken notions due to illusions. And this is referring to our tendency to confuse a bad state for a good one. Specifically, this passage is referring to how in spiritual practice we can become attached to certain sensations or states. A student may become concentrated and believe that state of concentration is good, and they become attached to it. But this is a mistake. Similarly, students become attached to getting out of the body or being in the sexual act, etc. So this statement also refers to external circumstances. People mistakenly think that once they're a member of a group, it's enough, a spiritual group or a religion. Or once they're following a teacher, it's enough. They are mistaking a set of external conditions to be sufficient for spiritual development, but it isn't. External conditions are impermanent. They are unreliable, and they don't change the condition of the consciousness. So this line of the scripture refers to mistaken perception of internal states and external events. The next one is missing the point. And this is how we believe those illusions and become diverted from the path. For example, we start attending a certain spiritual group. Uh, the teacher is very charismatic, and we think that by following this teacher, tradition, or religion, we are on our way to heaven. We're not practicing effectively, measurably. Instead, we're just a follower, a listener. This is to miss the point. Instability is the general fickleness of the mind. It's never satisfied. It's untamed. The next line says, pain, despair, tremor of the body, Irregular inhalation and exhalation are the companions of the causes of distraction, the oscillation of the mind. If you're experiencing any of these uh, qualities in your body, emotions, or intellect, then you know you're in psychological disequilibrium. Physical pain is obvious, but what about emotional pain? What about pain in the mind? When there's a mental conflict that we can't resolve, it becomes very painful. And we can't see the answer to something that seems absolutely unsolvable. And that is a painful situation for the mind. Pain here really refers to frustrated desire. It doesn't just mean physical pain during meditation practice. It also means the frustration you feel when you can't meditate. Despair is to lose hope, to lose faith, to feel like we can't do it. It's defeatism. We think I'm not capable of the spiritual path. I've sinned too much, or I don't have a spouse, or I don't have an instructor, or my mind is too crazy, or I have a sickness, or I have a problem physically or emotionally, or I'm too poor, I need money, or I have something that's stopping me. This is all despair. This is all the ego talking, and it's all an illusion. Tremor of the body refers to vibrations that happen because of disequilibrium in the three brains. Are you tapping your foot or your finger? Why? That is a tremor of the body, something in you that is venting energy. Usually it's impatience, frustration, anxiety, stress. When we meditate, is the body relaxed or is it tense, in pain, unsettled? All of that is because of the state of the mind, because of disequilibrium in the three brains. Irregular breathing is the same. Notice that when you get upset, your breathing changes. Your body becomes tense, whether you're excited, despairing, or angry. And that's a sign that your mind is imbalanced. When you have equilibrium, your breathing will be relaxed and steady. When you're meditating, you can watch for these obstacles and know that they are telling you that something is wrong psychologically. And to prevent them, all of them, all of the obstacles we've described in this lecture, the scripture says one should have intense practice on one subject. So this is the ultimate antidote explained by Patanjali. 
He's talking about concentration. Intense practice. Practice is something you keep doing. A professional athlete does not stop practicing. A professional musician does not stop practicing. A real meditator does not stop practicing. Modern intellectuals say that to reach mastery of any given task, we have to perform it for at least 10,000 hours. How many hours have you meditated in your lifetime? That's just what the intellectuals say. But let me point out something about that statement. There are a lot of people who've driven their cars for 10,000 hours and they're terrible drivers. And there are people who have cooked for 10,000 hours, yet their food is terrible. Just because you've done something a lot doesn't mean you know how to do it well. There are people who've prayed more than 10,000 hours, but they really don't know how to pray. And there are people who have meditated for 10,000 hours, but really don't know how to meditate. So to put the time and effort is one thing, but to know how to do properly is something else. So this is why we need to know how to study ourselves. We need to know how to revise what we're doing. With every spiritual practice you do, check the results. Don't just do things blindly. Measure what you're doing. Make sure that each step you take and each action you perform is effective. If not, find out why. Listen, the state of your soul is what's at stake. This isn't a game. This is not something to be taken lightly. This will affect your future lives, not just this one, but your future lives. And not just your life, but also those people you will influence. Contemplate that. That is how serious spiritual practice is. That is why every time you practice, you must analyze the practice. Was it effective? Was it not? What obstacles did you face? What mistakes did you make? Are you getting a measurable result, a measurable improvement in your practice? Are you reaching the goals? What if the Buddha did not double check his own practice while he was practicing? What would have happened? Obviously, we would not have had a Buddha Shakyamuni. What if Jesus did not double check himself and constantly refine his own practice, checking himself against the scriptures and against the masters? What would have been the result? His mission would have failed. So we also need to practice and check our practice against the facts every day. We need to constantly refine and improve our spiritual practice. Don't rely on what you think you know or what you think you were told. You have to constantly be checking your practice against the teachings and against the facts and revise it, improve it. This scripture says to prevent these obstacles, one should have intense practice on one subject. So in the previous lecture, we studied how if you really want yoga, learn to concentrate on the mantra OM. Not only when you take time to do your meditation each day, but throughout all your activities at all times and in all places. Did any of you actually do that practice from then till now? Are you still chanting OM constantly, silently or aloud? I would be surprised if even one person did it because most of us are simply too lazy. Or maybe we did it for a few days and then forgot. Or maybe we think we know better and we think to ourselves, I'm just going to keep doing this other practice that I've been doing for years and years. So ask yourself, did your approach work? Did what you were doing since the last lecture work? Did your spiritual practice advance measurably? Can you measure progress in yourself for the last month? Can you quantify your spiritual progress? Can you qualify it? Can you prove it? Do you have facts to back up the development of your spiritual practice? If you don't, then you have a psychological disequilibrium, a serious one, because it's affecting your spiritual work and the future of your soul. These are the types of spiritual facts that you must be dealing with. If you really want to understand yoga, if you really want to experience reality, if you really want to conquer suffering. You have to hold yourself to a very high standard. You can't be lazy. That's one of the obstacles. You can't have doubt. That is one of the obstacles. You can't have sensuality to be indulging in the senses all the time. That is one of the obstacles. We need a very rigorous self-analysis daily, constantly, 
And this is why in the very early part of this course, we recommended starting a spiritual diary and working with it every day. I'm quite sure no one here has done that either. What is the point of listening to lectures and studying the material if you're not applying it? You have to ask yourself that question. Why are you not applying the practices? Who gains from you not applying the practices? Who wants you to not apply them? If you're not doing the practices that we recommend, and if you're not following the sequence of practices that are being provided to you, then why are you here? If you aren't doing the practices of the school that you're following or the teacher you're studying under or the course that you're following, fine. But is what you're doing giving you measurable results? Are you actually achieving spiritual development that is measurable and congruent with the teachings? What are the facts of your spiritual life? Not beliefs, not wishes, not intentions, facts. Is your psyche changing for the better? Are you awakening in a measurable way? Are you penetrating into the causes of your suffering and rooting them out? If you are, wonderful. Continue. Do you consider yourself to be a serious student? By what measure? How are you measuring that seriousness? By intentions or by actual progress? Measurable facts. Having serious intentions is admirable, but useless if measurable gains are not acquired. Everyone has good intentions, but how many actualize them? There are many who consider themselves serious students and are even instructors, but they cannot concentrate. Remember the stages of yoga. Yama is self-restraint. Niyama are the precepts. Asana is to be relaxed at all times. Pranayama is to harness the life force. Pratyahara is to suspend the senses. Dharana is to have concentration. Dhyana is to enter actual meditation where we retrieve information about something. And samadhi is the super conscious state, ecstasy, blissfulness, in which the consciousness escapes the ego and experiences liberation. So I want you to meditate right now and see what stage of these eight stages you can access at will. Measurable facts. Meditate right now and see which of these levels, which of these states you can experience at will at this moment. So, which stage of those eight limbs were you able to reach? Even the first one, yama, the ethics. Are you practicing the second one, niyama, to have the precepts? Are you really fully relaxed? Do you have asana? Is the body completely and utterly relaxed? No tension anywhere at all. Are you able to achieve pranayama in which you harness the winds, especially the sexual energy? Can you feel it? Can you sense it? Do you know it? What about pratyahara? Can you experience the state of consciousness in which you perceive that the senses become abstracted? What about dharana? Can you actually concentrate on one thing and not be distracted at all? Dhyana? Can you penetrate into that thing and start gaining information about that thing? Samadhi, can you extract the consciousness from the ego? If you have psychological equilibrium and truly understand yoga, then you can reach Samadhi anytime, anywhere at will. Listen, having intellectual understanding is not enough. You need to be able to experience all of these states at will. I know beginners who can access all these states because they are serious about practicing meditation. But I also know many more students who have much more intellectual knowledge than those beginners, 
But those so-called uh, more educated students can't even reach Pratyahara. They can't even tell if pranayama works. And if they can't establish Pratyahara, they definitely cannot go beyond that to dharana, dhyana, or samadhi. So really, they're wasting their time. I also know instructors who cannot reach Pratyahara or dharana or dhyana or samadhi, even though they teach about them. Why? Because they are unwilling to revise their practice. They think they already know how to practice. They have bad habits. They have wrong concepts, wrong thoughts, wrong ideas. They don't understand the facts of these states. They have theories. Secretly, privately, they're in great pain, despair, and doubt. But they're not serious about changing them. They aren't serious about revising their practice and improving it. They think they already know. They think they're already advanced. They think they don't need the basics, and that's precisely their problem. They ignore the basics, and that's why they're stuck. If you're able to meditate, reach samadhi, and acquire a comprehension of your defects, that is excellent, and you have what you need to go further on the path. But if you're not capable of that, then you need to analyze your practice, find your weaknesses, and improve. During the time that I visited India, I met many students of yoga who were very serious about their meditation practice. Subsequently, they were able to experience and access all the stages of yoga up to samadhi. They did not have even a fraction of the knowledge that we teach here, yet they did have seriousness and dedication to practice. If any student were to combine these two, real dedication to practice and the complete knowledge that's available now, experience in meditation would be acquired easily. When students complain to me that they're not having experience in meditation, it is obvious that they are not serious about recognizing and overcoming their obstacles. They might attempt to meditate for an hour or two a day, but if they aren't advancing, it's because of one of these obstacles and they're not willing to change it. Atanjali says that to conquer these obstacles, we need to learn concentration. He suggests the mantra Om, which is the name of our being. When you utilize the mantra Om, it engages a tremendous energy. For this to work, First, you must be saving energy in all three brains, saving intellectual energy by avoiding useless thinking, saving emotional energy by stopping emotional indulgences, and saving the sexual energy by avoiding the orgasm and lust in general. So the one who saves energy and uses this mantra OM all day long, concentrating on that mantra, being present, rapidly develops concentration. And this overpowers the obstacles and makes them visible so that we can change them. Then in addition to that, one should also take time to sit still, shutting all the senses down except imagination and concentrate on imagining that mantra. When doing this, one should be focused only on the mantra Om, nothing else. Forget the body, forget the outside world, do not pay attention to thoughts, emotions, or any sensations. Focus 100% of your attention on that mantra OM. So for this, you need a place where you can be in complete silence and be completely relaxed. Don't play music. Don't have any distractions around you. Make sure you're very comfortable and your body can be completely relaxed so it can essentially be in a sleepy state. This is the same practice that we gave in the previous lecture. But now we have to go deeper with it. Use this mantra OM in all times, in all places, and in all things. Use it to help you balance your three brains. It invokes the presence of your innermost, so it has great power. So let's consider something for a moment. All of us come to these types of studies because we really long to be free of suffering. We're tired of pain and we're tired of suffering. We want to know something about the reality of God that is inside of us. That reality can only be known by ourselves through our own effort. I cannot give you that, and no one else can give you that. Become serious. Study your temple. Study your body, your heart, and your mind. Find impurities and remove them. When you find things in yourself that make your inner temple dirty, now you know why God is not coming there. So change it. Clean the temple. Fill your inner temple with that mantra. 
Now, let's explain how this type of concentration works. There are two primary forms of concentration practice. First is the exclusive type. Second is the non-exclusive type. Exclusive concentration focuses on one thing and excludes everything else. Non-exclusive concentration pays attention to everything that is perceivable and seeks to expand attention more and more to perceive what previously was not perceivable. And for this, one needs training, very good concentration, and lots of energy. So the more powerful and potent type of concentration is the non-exclusive type, but it is also more difficult. It requires that you first have some ability to concentrate. So in order to prepare for the non-exclusive type of concentration, we first teach the exclusive type in the beginning, like any other tradition. To meditate on OM is an exclusive type of concentration. And what that means is that you're excluding everything but focusing on OM. You're only focusing on OM, nothing else. And that's why the scripture says to intensely practice on one subject. You don't have to use OM, you can use anything. If you want to meditate on a rock, go ahead. If you want to concentrate on a leaf or a flower, anything at all, go ahead. You can do that. You can develop concentration that way. But the reason OM is recommended is because it has added power. OM has more power than a rock. OM has more powerful than a catchy phrase or a drawing on the wall. OM has an energetic power. It's connected directly to your innermost. If you want to work with a symbol of OM that you hang up in your home and visualize and look at, do it. This is an effective way to meditate as long as you do it in the right way. Exclusive meditation means when you're concentrating on OM, do not pay attention to anything else. 100% of your attention needs to be on that object. Your mind, your heart, and body will not like this. They will all try to distract you with discomfort, pain, sensations, hunger, thirst, thoughts, feelings, memories, desires, anything that the mind can use to keep you identified. If you have sufficient willpower, you work hard, and you relax, you'll discover that your concentration gets stronger. The more you do it, the stronger it gets, especially if you're saving energy and practicing all day long to be concentrated and present, then concentration develops very quickly. The state that you want to reach is to be able to pay attention to what you're doing and not forget that you're doing it. Carefully consider that. If you reflect on yourself and what you observe in yourself, you'll realize that you can't even wash the dishes without thinking about something else. That's what's got to change. When you sit to meditate, you may have all the enthusiasm in the world, but after 30 seconds, you become distracted and start dreaming. That shows a complete and utter lack of concentration. Zero concentration. Fix that. Develop concentration such that you're able to be aware of meditating for the entire meditation session, whether it's five minutes or an hour. It takes hard work, but it pays off. Here's what you need to watch for. Facts. Observe the facts in yourself. There are periods of time which you are aware of what you're doing and periods of time in which you're not. For most of us, we're not aware of what we're doing most of the time. If you're not sure what the answer to that question is, every single night, sit down, close your eyes, and remember every moment from the whole day. Put together a timeline or a movie of your memories of the whole day, and you'll find that there are big gaps of time that you don't remember. If you don't remember what happened to you that day, then you were not present and paying attention at those times. You were asleep. That shows you that your powers of concentration and your ability to be present are extremely weak. That is the first value of this type of practice. It changes this problem. The more you work with this uh, concentration technique, the quicker you'll change it. If you work seriously with it, in proportion to how hard you work will be the shortness of time until you reach the stage at which you do not forget what you're doing. Someone who changes this problem can concentrate for an hour, two, 
three hours and not lose awareness of what they're doing ever. This is a wonderful achievement, but still only a beginner level. Such a person needs to begin using the non-exclusive type of concentration. So really check yourself against the facts. If you think that you're an advanced student, check it against the facts. If you can access Samadhi anytime, anywhere, then yeah, maybe you're an advanced student and all you need to do is advance on, is uh, meditate on your defects and comprehend them. But if you can't access Samadhi anytime, anywhere, then you need to learn about the obstacles within you that are keeping you from it. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.